So this poster illustrates elements that are in what we call the standard model. The standard model of elementary or fundamental particles and interactions. It, you know, physics, particle physics especially, but really physics as a whole is a reductionist science. Our goal more often than not is to understand the interactions at their most fundamental level, hoping that that fundamental understanding will help us build a better understanding of more complicated structures. You saw a good example that example of that in quantum mechanics with uh, with the periodic table. So you know chemists have discovered a lot of things about periodic table, but in the chemistry way of approaching, they didn't understand. They didn't know the fundamental reason for the the existence of periodic table until the discovery of uh, quantum mechanics, the laws of quantum mechanics. Then that's when we could explain the entire table with a few simple rules. And th that remains our goal. So we discover subatomic particles, we realize uh, protons and, well, I guess electrons are okay, but protons are not the most uh, fundamental, These atoms are not the most uh, fundamental um, building blocks of the nature. So we go deeper. We go looking for, okay, what particles are fundamental, elementary. And this uh, understanding that's been built up over, um, over decades of work uh, from around beginning of quantum mechanics, 1930s, through all, all, nearly all elements of standard model were finalized, I think around the 1980s, 1980s, 1990s. That's, uh, um, uh, that's the acceptance of the quark model and the electroweak unification and discovery of the W bosons. So, um, so it's a half a century of work that uh, captured into this one poster. So we went through some uh, corners of this poster in previous lecture. What I want to kind of walk through now and talk about is well, where we are at. So looking at this poster of the standard model, this is what we see. We see, um, we see 12 elementary fermions, um, elementary leptons, electron, neutrino, and there are three generations like that, muon, muon neutrino, tau, tau neutrino, and elementary quarks up and down, and there are three generations like that. Charm and Strange, top and bottom. And we are not even counting their antiparticles. I think I tried to start doing that and then it got a bit complicated. So, okay, I'm not counting antiparticles, 12, 12 elementary fermions. And we have elementary bosons. Uh, they are uh, force carriers. So we have photon, the force carrier of electromagnetic interaction. And we have uh, the, the force carriers of the weak interaction. There are three of them. There's the neutral G boson. Um, it's like a photon, except uh, it's very heavy. And it, um, it mediates the weak force, not the electromagnetic force. And then there's the charged W and uh, W bosons, W minus and W plus. And gluon, even though it, the table lists only one, as they say somewhere here, um, it's quark, uh, they, uh, there are eight possible types of color charge for gluons. Uh, and we went through the reasons for why there are eight types of gluons. So there's eight types of gluons. So in terms of elementary bosons, we have um, one, two, three, four and then a 12 elementary bosons. Now I'm overcounting some of these. Um, so like W minus and W plus, they are particle antiparticle pairs of each other. So if uh, you say I'm double counting some of these, all right, fine. But there's uh, something like a 10 elementary bosons. Um, and I guess that's it in terms of uh, fundamental particles, 12 elementary fermions, 12 elementary bosons. And between those 
24 <laughs> elementary particles, we cover nearly everything we need to know about um, the fundamental interactions. Not quite everything, but nearly everything. Between those, um, our theories, we are covering the electromagnetic force. That's kind of where we started out with. And it's actually unified in what's called the electronic theory. It's a, this is actually the final building block of the standard model. There was the final piece of the uh, theoretical piece that came together before we had something that people were starting to call standard model of elementary inter, uh, particles. So we have an electronic force. And we have a strong force that uh, describes the interaction between quarks, uh, hadrons. And all this kind of leaves out gravity entirely. Um, the thing about gravity and the general relativity theory of gravity is that it's um, quite difficult to uh, quantize it, uh, quite difficult to build a theory of quantum gravity. So we haven't been talking about gravity and we will end up not talking about gravity. I mean, so we all, all these particles do interact gravitationally. It's just that um, um, it, it's a more of a gravity in the sense of like a Newtonian uh, gravity or, um, or even general relativity, just uh, uh, without in the circumstances where we don't have to worry about the quantum mechanical properties of things. So, so this is our elementary theory of almost everything. Uh, two or uh, three out of four interactions and all the elementary particles that we know. Now, there are some features of this that people find incomplete, almost unsatisfactory. And this is one of the reasons why. So we have 12 elementary fermions, and I want you to think about that. And the reason I didn't count antiparticles separately is that antiparticles actually have more or less the same property as the particle. So we have electron and we have positron, the po but the positron would have almost all the same properties as electron. It would have same mass, it would have same spin. The only thing it would differ on is the electric charge, and even there, the only thing that's a different is that it's plus one. It's not an entirely different charge. So, you know, that's why I'm not counting antiparticles. You could say, you just nail down what the particles are and antiparticle will just follow, maybe. And, um, and even, so, and it, as you look at each of these elementary fermions, each elementary fermion is characterized by, oh, I'm trying to remember, all their parameters. Uh, you see three represented here. Sometimes people will include a fourth one, the gyro magnetic ratio, but let's not include that for now and then just to deal with the three for now. <laughs> um, so each elementary fermion has a spin associated with it, a charge associated with it, and a mass associated with it. And maybe as you are looking at this table, you recognize some pattern and you realize spin, that doesn't really seem like a, its own independent parameter. It's quantized and all these are spin half particles. Maybe we want some explanation why they must be spin half, but once we have that one explanation for one of them, it probably applies to all 12 of them. So you say, okay, spin, that's one parameter. And charge, they kind of commit discrete quantized quantities. So maybe you are also willing to say the charges are separate, it's one parameter. Once you kind of have an understanding, reasoning for the amount of elementary charge, amount of charge that electron has, then that reasoning applies to everything. That's kind of what we want to find in a reductionist science. You want to come up with one elementary explanation for everything or close to everything. Now, this is where you run into problem. With uh, these 12 elementary fermions, you, know, you have 12 different masses and there is no theory that predicts masses of any of these. Electron mass, it's measured, not 
predicted theoretically in any way. Muon mass, it's also measured. It's not theoretically predicted in any way. In the lecture, we talked about how muon was initially mistaken for the role that pion took on. Tau lepton, um, that's the mass it has, uh, heavier even than a proton, and that's how much mass it has, no rhyme or reason. And neutrinos, for a while, we thought they would be massless. That would have been nice. There have been three parameters that we didn't have to worry about why they are all these random values. But um, our current thinking is that they are not massless. Uh, and it's actually confirmed through observed neutrino oscillations since um, like late 90s, early 2000s. Um, one of them might be massless, but that doesn't solve our problem because one being massless and the other two having mass, it, it, that still means we have three Fourier parameters. Same problem with the quarks. All these masses are different and other than kind of the general pattern that each generation of quarks have heavier, higher mass, um, all these are not theoretically predicted. So, even just to looking at the masses, you have 12 free parameters here. And we don't stop there. We have our elementary fermions. <laughs> I'm sorry. We have our elementary bosons. Um, photon is massless. That's nice. And actually, gluon is massless. That's also nice. Uh, massless particles are nice. That's almost um, what you would expect these particles to be in their natural state without any perturbations and other things that complicate things. W bosons and G bosons have mass. And the Higgs mechanism, which is the central piece of electroweak unification, Higgs mechanism explains why these particles have mass, where photon doesn't, and these are supposed to be siblings of photon. So Higgs mechanism explains how this could be non-zero, but Higgs mechanism doesn't actually predict. It doesn't actually tell you what the masses should be. It's just a mechanism to explain, oh, that's how these particles gain the mass. So looking at the elementary bosons, we have uh, one and two free parameters. And uh, there are other parameters that are not directly uh, visible on this chart. Let's see here. Ah, I think you can see it here. It talks about um, it talks about coupling strength. So for each of these interactions, there's a coupling strength that's associated with each interaction. There's coupling strength for electromagnetic interaction. There's coupling strength for weak interaction. There's coupling strength for strong interaction. So that's a minimum of three parameters. And I think those coupling strengths, they vary as a function of interaction energy. So it's a three, not constant parameters, but three functions. <laughs> so this is where I hope you are beginning to see the complexity. It almost has, um, I, I hope as you are looking at this poster and hearing this description that it feels more like the periodic table than the, um, than the Pauli's exclusion principle. Uh, standard model has, I think when you count it all up, there should be about 23 parameters. It's, it's a model with 23 parameters and it's our best model. No, nothing that it's our, it's the state of the art of our knowledge. Well, not this poster, but um, I guess if I'm technically being accurate, then I would uh, show the actual standard model post poster, the current version, one that includes the Higgs boson. So, so I can show you that if that looks a little bit better, but at the very fundamental level, it doesn't change that um, you have something close to 20 free parameters to describe everything that's here. And that large number of parameters you have, it's, um, um, I mean, I, I guess fundamentally there's necessarily nothing wrong with it. Um, it's like, so it, the objection that we physicists express is more at philosophical level and also in a way of best practice or 
um, what you should expect to see for a fundamental theory of nature. Um, I think the best way to explain the problem is, imagine you have, um, you have an, uh, some arbitrary function, some curve, and you want to have, um, you want to explain where that curve comes from. What are the factors that influence what that curve looks like? And, um, and you know, that's kind of what science is. You have uh, experimental data and you try to come up with a theory that fits the data, use the theory to predict something, see if you get what you predicted. It's an iterative process. Now, when you introduce uh, too many free parameters, you can have something that's called overfitting to the data. Because frankly, give me an unlimited number of free parameters and I can fit to basically any, um, any curve that's out there with a polynomial of infinite order. I, I can just do that. You know, you just fit a hundredth order polynomial, give me a hundred free parameters. I can match to any random curve that I see. So, I mean, <laughs> if you want to just fit a curve, then that's great if, that you've done it. But, um, but from that fitted curve, you don't have any uh, causal relationship. You don't have any explanations. And, and that's the problem here with a standard model. It's got like a 23 parameters and, um, and we, we don't yet have a unified thing that we can use to drive all those free parameters. And, um, and I think uh, I started this unit with uh, reference to, uh, with reference to something that Thomas Kuhn wrote back in the sixties. So this is before development of a standard model. He wasn't making this remark specifically about the standard model. It's not about it. Um, yeah, this is it. Uh, our last graded discussion. And um, yeah, so I want you to introduce this uh, kind of critical view of things in the context of special relativity and quantum mechanics first, because those are settled revolutions. We feel like we understand special relativity and quantum mechanics, it's all good, all the tumultuous things that happened in the early 19th or early 20th century, 1920 something. And um, so we are at a more comfortable place of looking at how much things changed. And what I want to say is that, well, the revolution may not be over. It's, uh, or I hope it's not over because the, what we think is the current best uh, understanding of the fundamental nature of the universe, it doesn't look very fundamental. It's got a lot of free parameters that don't have a fundamental explanations on why they are the way they are. So I hope someone uh, next year, 10 years down the line, 100 years down the line, someone discovers the more fundamental theory. And there are many scientists uh, working on those fundamental theories. They usually go by the name of something like beyond the standard model. That's the phrase. Physics beyond the standard model is what people are looking for. And that's the work of both the theorists and experimentalists. And um, I guess this Wikipedia article is probably a good article to read through to see um, what kind of um, defects there are about the standard model. And um, and you know, the different physicists will have different opinion about some of these approaches. Um, if you ever ask me about string theory, I'll have very poor opinion of string theory, but I'm not a string theorist, so what do I know? Um, but, uh, um, but the standard model is quite interesting because history is uh, riddled with uh, theories and uh, in, um, in Thomas Kuhn's words, a paradigm. Where does he say the word paradigm? Does he ever say the word paradigm? Well, <laughs> if you read his writing, there's some place where he does say paradigm. Um, usually, 
we are in science, we are used to seeing a paradigm, established paradigm that people believe in. This is the way things are. And anyone who challenges it is a heretic. That's the kind of the story between heliocentrism and geocentrism. And heliocentrism was, was around for a long time. It was around for a thousand years. Ptolemy's model of epicycles, they lasted for a thousand years. And for a thousand years, there wasn't any serious belief on ge in geocentrism. And uh, with the standard model, the interesting thing is that from its very birth, no one really believed that this would be the, um, the fundamental theory of nature. If anything, physicists are actually surprised how long it's lasted, test of time, and for how long it hasn't already been replaced by something else. Um, so it's, uh, it's what some people call theory of almost everything. Uh, there's a book uh, called, uh, I think, uh, Unsung Heroes, um, Theory of Almost Everything. I think uh, that's the, yeah. Yeah, the, this is the book that I'm trying to remember. <laughs> the Stan model, the unsung trial for modern physics. So, uh, which is another good book to read. Um, it, it, I think uh, so the story of the Stan model is um, unique in uh, history of science. It's, uh, it's the established paradigm. It's the orthodoxy. It's uh, the representation of the best thing um, that we know about physics as it stands today. And from its very birth, <laughs> no one thinks, and no one still thinks that this would be the ultimate theory of physics. And we are still looking for the ultimate theory of physics and hopefully we'll find it eventually. And somehow, if we never do, that will be, that'll be something. Because um, I don't think there has an, ever been anything like that in the story. Because the story of physics is um, kind of a story of unification over time, story of simplification over time. And this to me, or this to me, doesn't look like a unified theory of anything. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah.